good morning, Kira Koto. Uh, welcome to our webinar for the day. Um, I am Nisha. I'm the training lead at NISI. Um, I'm here to facilitate the conversation that we're going to have today and um, also listen to any training requests you might have uh, or you might think of while we go through this webinar. So um, welcome. Our webinar for the day is X-ray and DASK for uh, Geoscience. And we have two speakers um, who've come, who've taken time out to come here and speak to all of us today, uh, Dr. Jan Schindler and Dr. Rose Pearson. And the entire conversation will be facilitated by Dr. Maxime Rio, who will be helping out um, throughout the conversation. So uh, before we get into the webinar itself, if I can just quickly take you through some housekeeping notes before we start. So please make sure to mute your microphones uh, during the course of the webinar, uh, just so we minimize any sort of disturbance uh, and uh, just to ensure that the speakers are, are able to speak to us clearly um, through the entire course of the webinar. Um, please note that this webinar is being recorded. So I just clicked on the record button and, and as you can see, there's a little red dot on top of your screen maybe. Uh, that means that we are currently being recorded. Uh, the recordings will be sent out to you um soon after the webinar and uh the question so if you have any questions or comments during the course of the webinar uh please make sure to use this google doc link which i'm going to now post on chat um please use that google doc uh to uh, write your name and have any note down any questions or comments you might have and uh, Maxime and I will moderate it throughout the webinar and make sure that the speakers uh, get to those questions at the end so please note that we'll be taking questions and comments at the end of the webinar um, to avoid any sort of disruption in the middle and please do turn on your cameras if possible um, I understand that all of us might not be able to do so but uh, this is just to um, um, ensure that the speakers aren't talking to blank screens and they don't feel as lonely. So um, that's about it. And uh, bef uh, before we begin, just I would love to get uh, Jan and Rose to quickly introduce themselves and we can go from there. Um, Jan, over to you. Thank you. Um, I'm Jan. Um, I'm a remote sensing scientist. Um, at Manaki Fino Land Care Research. Um, my sort of general background is um, all kinds of earth observation te techniques, um, atmospheric sciences and um, GS and environmental sciences. And yeah, I will talk more about um, what I do at Land Care Research later on in my talk. Thanks, Jan. Uh, Rose? Um... Kira. <clears throat> Uh, I'm Rose, uh, I'm at NIWA and I'm also a remote sensing scientist and I'll be giving the first half of this webinar, but my background's um, more recently in taking LIDAR or other forms of remote sensing data and transforming it into a kind of form where it can be used by modelers to model uh, earth processes or processes. Awesome. Thanks, Rose. Thanks, Jan. Uh, Maxime, a quick intro. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Maxime Rio. I'm working at uh, NISI at the part of the consultancy services and also at NIWA as a data scientist. And I'm here because I, I have some experience with the toolboxes we'll be talking about today. And I'll be happy to answer any question if you put them in the chat and in the Google Doc. And I think on this, that's it. Thanks, Maxime. Uh, I guess we can slowly begin then. I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, Rose? Yeah. I guess I'm back then. Ooh. Sorry, bear with me while I do the normal juggle. Sorry. 
Sorry about this. How's that? Can you see my screen? Yes. Cool. So I'm going to start um, by just talking a bit about X-ray and dusk um, generally. So I like to view X-ray as a combination. Well, first of all, uh, this is I'm sort of assuming everybody's got a background in Python. Um, so these are both Python packages. Um, and I like to view X-ray as a combination of NumPy and Pandas, which are both sort of parts of your typical Python sort of package stack. So NumPy is kind of the array side of things and Pandas, um, many of you will be familiar with their data frames um, for labeled data. And I've got this from X-arrays documentation. Key thing here is we've got arrays and they're labeled. So if we look to the side of the screen here, can you see my mouse? Yes, we can. Um, so we've got data variables. Uh, in this case, we've got 3D arrays, effectively, uh, temperature and pressure. And then to the side, we've got coordinates. And these describe the data. So we've got a 2D array um, of elevation and man cover. Um, and that sort of says something about the pressure measurements. We can see to the side here, we've got these indexes uh, for latitude and longitude. So those both describe the land cover elevation or some pressure. So locations in space along those two dimensions. And we've got this other axis, axis um, which is time. So we've here got pressure and temperature measurements in space and through time along that axis. Um, and that's, that's really powerful uh, as we can do all the normal things you can do with arrays, manipulation, mathematics, um, but we can do it for both temperature and pressure. And we can also keep track of the um, <clears throat> keep track of the coordinates. So you can potentially combine pressure and temperature if you knew there was some sort of physical relationship between them. And they would keep track of the fact that we've got locations in space and time, and they would add the right time boxes plus the right spatial um, boxes. Uh, so it's really powerful and nice. Um, and it's also allows for, for selection where you can select in time or space. Um, and again, also um, interpolation. So it's all kind of out of the box. And there's also these attributes, uh, which are really, which are actually quite powerful. Um, so you can add a lot of metadata um, to your X-rays. So if we look here, uh, this is a kind of the standard rich Python output. If you were to view an X-ray in um, a Jupyter notebook or your IPython console. Um, and if we just start at the top, we've got um, our dimensions x, y, which are defined as coordinates. Um, and in this case, the, the NZTM2000, which is a, a basically a coordinate reference system, uh, which is used by our topo 50 maps if you go tramping. Um, so that's basically defining places in space. Um, and this spatial reference has a bunch of information around that coordinate reference system if you're able to transfer, transform it to maybe a, a more global one. Um, and then we've got our data variables. So we've got three of these. I won't go into the details here. Just trust it's something to do with the digital elevation model, Z elevations. Um, so these are values kind of in space. And then we've got our attributes. And there are quite a few standard um, attribute values, like title, source, history, description, that you can choose to populate. You have to populate those yourself. This is a sort of data set that I created um, in the tool we'll be talking about later. Um, so Geofabrics is this, this package that I've been developing. And um, you know, I've basically put in information here so I can keep track of the history, keep track of what version it was created with. Um, so that's also really powerful as well. And now we've got Dask, which is a different Python package. And it's really all about parallelizing Python code and doing it simply and easily. So if we look in the middle here, we've got this task graph. And basically, each, so we've got our Python code and we're doing some operations. And each of these, each of these squares or circles are some, some Python operation 
or groups of operation or function. Um, and the cool thing about Dask is you sort of tell your code, you basically write your normal Python code, but you've loaded in Dask um, and you might do a few quite small, uh, just like you set up a, um, you, you sort of indicate that you're using Dask and then it will look at your code and it will figure out which operations can be done in parallel, which ones, what, what the dependencies are between your bits of code. So here we've got two operations that can be done in parallel and then we've got um, some sort of series operations that can't, that have to be done sequentially. Um, and over here, we've got three other operations as well that have to be done sequentially, but can be done at the same time as these other four operations. And the really neat thing is you don't have to explicitly encode this, Dask looks through your code and works it out. So that's the sort of task graph and um, it's something that you can view as well. Um, so it's one, one key part of Dask. Another one is the collections. So these are high level application programming interfaces or APIs to get a bit technical. But basically, if we think about Dask arrays, that's effectively like your NumPy array or your X array, and you just treat it, you write your normal NumPy or X array code. Um, but in behind that, it is a Dask array, um, which means you get all of this kind of power and functionality of, of Dask. And for this talk, we're going to be talking, focusing on these Dask arrays, specifically X array, um, Dask arrays. Um, but there's this third part as well, which is a scheduler. And there'll be a bit more of a focus on this in the second half of the webinar. But this is basically how you do your compute. So you delegate to a scheduler. There's a few options you can select. Um, and you, this allows you to potentially use one scheduler to either run your code on your laptop or on the HPC. Um, and again, we'll be covered more in the second part. So here I've uh, just got a video of a dashboard. Um, so this comes out of the box for, for Dask. Um, it's an awesome tool and you really should use it if you want to make full good use of Dask. Um, and I've just got the standard display here. So basically I started something that uses Dask, a little URL or code came up so I could navigate to this particular um, web address and then this just starts starts and um, you can kind of see what's happening. Um, so yeah, in this view, we've got um, memory usage per worker. We've got the number of tasks per worker. We've got um, the progress of sort of um, different operations that you're doing and uh, for the overall um, operation that you're trying to do. So we can see for these three main tasks, we're 58 out of 90. Um, and then this is where the work's happening. Now, for Dask and X-Ray, or X-Ray and Dask, um, if you remember before, we had a, a, a display, a rich display of um, an X-Ray. Here, we've got the same display, but when I've loaded it using Dask. So this is a, um, you know, IPython display. And you can see um, up here, we've got, now we've got a, a display of the chunks um, of that, that make up that, X-ray, and I guess we're looking at just one of the um, one of the data variables, so Z elevation. And the cool thing here is this hasn't actually been loaded into memory, but it does tell you exactly how large it would be if you did load it into memory. If you've got a few options here, you can do lazy load, for instance, where you just load in one of these chunks at a time or per worker, does its thing, um, and then it writes it out to the right place in in memory potentially. If you were to then save save the file somewhere else. Um, and these, or each of these chunks can be run in, in parallel, depending on, you know, what operations you're done, doing. Yeah. Um, uh, over here, uh, this is again from the standard Dask documentation. Um, and this just shows, really emphasizes for a Dask array that it's made up of either NumPy arrays or in our case, Dask arrays. Um, to really sort of emphasize, I guess, the, the structure here um, for those collections. Cool. So for the second part of my bit, I'm going to be telling you about Geofabrics, which is a Python package I've been developing. Um, and I've been developing it 
for a big endeavor funded project, Mate Maru or Te Wai, which is all about river flood modeling and trying to help New Zealand become more resilient to that. We've got an image here, which I quite like. So it's from the recent Nelson floods, but I mean, those floods obviously aren't good. But the reason I like the image is you can see the, the river here, um, which is obviously heaving. It's, it's definitely in flood, but you can also see the, the impact that's, that that's had on the surrounding infrastructure and communities. Um, and that's really what we're trying to target. How can we improve our modeling of flooding so we can say, look ahead 20 years when climate change is run a bit further and see, do we need to start thinking about moving some of our you know, key infrastructure communities? Uh, or there's a storm coming in a week's time. We've got some predictions of how much you know, rainfall is happening. What do we need to do in response? Anyway, enough about that. Jeff Fabrics this package. It's an open source Python package. And it's used for, in the, in the bigger, in the big picture, it's used for creating flood inundation maps. So this is a flood inundation map. You can see some sort of storm event and the dark blue is where there's lots of water. The white where this is where there's not really much water. So that's what we're, that's what it's aiming to help with. But Geofabrics itself just focuses on converting LIDAR point clouds into digital elevation models. And just so you've got an image of what a LIDAR point cloud is, here's a sort of 2D view. Basically, you've got a bunch of laser points that are flying from a plane, they reflect off things, bounce back up, you end up with a 3D point cloud. So it's like an umpire array of points in, in space. And that's great, it gives you lots of information about elevation, but it's not in a form that we can use for creating these flood inundation maps. We, we, for that, we need gridded data, regular gridded data, so if we look down here, this is a digital elevation model, um, kind of regularly spaced values in the X and Y axes. Um, and in each location, we've got an elevation. So this is like a matrix. This is like an X array. And the, the, the overall project, Mate Maru or Te Wai, is focused on creating consistent maps across all of Aotearoa so we can have consistency in our response to this this hazard of river flooding, and where um, this this map basically shows where light is available now in green, where it's being collected at the moment in, in yellow, and where sort of you know we're at the early stages of collecting this information. So we both need to be able to run it quickly, given this is a whole bunch of area, but we also need to be able to run it, like rerun it um, easily. So that's a big focus of, of the development. Um, so yeah, basically it needs to be fast. How can we make it fast? Well, we've got lots of access to compute on Nessie and our problem is massively parallelizable as we can treat each um, elevation square separately, which is where Dusk comes in. So if we look a bit more at sort of an architectural view of geofabrics, Multi-step processing pipeline. This image is a bit busy though, so let's kind of simplify it down um, for what we care about here. We've basically, so in green, we've got our processing steps. Red is all the different data that's either taken in or produced along the way. And if we think about this data and the processing steps, so we've got our point data, NumPy arrays. We've got some gridded data, that's X arrays. We've got some GIS data, which we can read in with GeoPandas, pandas, so labeled sort of data frames. Um, and for all the processing steps, we've got Dask, which allows us to take things that aren't necessarily gridded data and turn them into gridded data, which is great. Um, and then the ultimate output is labeled gridded, gridded data. So I'm going to give a bit of a demo, uh, but I also thought I'd show a quick task graph of geofabrics. And that you can see is pretty meaningless. There's a bunch of little circles and squares. Um, so I'll just zoom in, uh, but basically a whole bunch of things running in parallel. And in each, each stage, we start here. So that's basically, we've got a chunk of data. And if you remember our X-ray that we're trying to produce, the output is a whole bunch of different chunks. So in that, we're going to load in a bunch of tiles. And these are 
individual write up files, individual point files, and then we're concatenating them all together, combining them, and then we're going to calculate the elevation over that individual chunk, and then this produces chunk index 00. zero. This is the one next to it, that's one next to it, and eventually you'll be one row down. But anyway, so that's kind of what we've what, what, what processing we're doing. But if we think about this, I called it a demo, but you know, um, recorded, pre-prepared, um, I basically wanted to show the main levers that I pulled when trying to figure out how I go from something that could work on my machine for a mid-size pro problem to something that I could run on the HPC for, for a much larger area. So key, key levers to pull are the numbers of number of workers you've got, the chunk size, and the memory limit. And if we jump to here, we've got, um, excuse a slight uh, sort of offset in starting time. Turns out producing videos is not my strong point, but we've got four different configurations with different numbers of workers, memory limits, or chunk sizes. Um, and I was aiming for, to, bear, to keep it 20 gigabytes and then 20, 250 by 250 chunks, but the video ultimate captured here is 10 gigabytes, but this is pretty much the same as if it was 20 gigabytes. Um, it just kind of schedules a bit quicker. But anyway, here we've got one worker, we've got our 20 gigabytes and we've got our 250 by 250 chunks. You can see it's sort of starting to um, process. Here we've got almost exactly the same thing, slightly smaller gigabyte limit, but we've got 20 workers. Um, so yeah, kind of keep an eye on the two of those and their relative sort of um, processing time as, as time goes on. As we look down here, in this case, I've changed the chunk size. So I made it larger, which means overall we have fewer chunks because each one's four times the size. And I've kept the gigabyte limit the same and the number of workers the same. And over here, we've got our same 20 workers, we've got a much smaller gigabyte limit and we're at the same size of chunk, 250 by 250. So if you think about the memory limit, that's a good one to vary. Well, you basically want to make that as small as you can such that everything still works smoothly because this reduces how much you pay if you are in a HPC environment like Nessie. It also reduces the, sch the schedule time. So how long you have to be queued up before your job can start. Um, and if we look here on this one at the moment, we've got a few kind of orange, orange lines at the moment. Um, hopefully I don't pause things. Just make sure it's still, sorry all. Um, we had some orange lines here and that's kind of warning that, sorry, I'm just gonna re-trigger. Um, as you can see here, we've got a few um, sort of orange orange um, workers. So each one of those is a worker um, and that's indicating that it's getting close to the memory limit that we set. So we can just keep an eye on that and see like, that's, that's fine, that's orange. If they turn red, that means basically it's gone too far. The worker gets killed, it has to respawn. Um, so, you, so you can see one has turned red here and in a moment it's going to disappear. And in that case, that, that's, that's, that's not ideal. We, this indicates, you know, looking at that, it's like, okay, cool. Five gigabytes is too little. I'll increase the limit um, and then just restart. And if we look over here, where we've got our uh, 500 by 500 chunks. You can see in that case, we've only got 75 um, tasks in total and we've got 20 workers. We're also getting some memory issues here because we've got more data for each. Um, and we've got quite a few workers here that are currently like they're not they're not allocated so it's a sign that actually probably it'd be more efficient to have more tasks you're kind of weighing up the number of tasks having quite a few of them so you can efficiently schedule them but not having so many that um the operations they're doing are outweighed by the scheduling time so you don't want the overhead to be more than um the time to um, actually do the do the task. And I know these are slightly out of kilter now, our top two, um, given I did that restart of the of the time. But you can see here, ultimately, once it's gotten going, it's um, run just dramatically faster than 
uh, um, one worker compared to 20 workers. So yeah, we can kind of skip along and you know, it's still slowly, slowly going away and uh, going along. And by this point, this one um, has completed its operation. So quickly wanted to summarize um, my learnings. Um, basically, use the dashboard. Um, local cluster is the best schedule to use. It's not the default, but just um, start with that one. Chunk size, um, experiment with it. Use the dashboard to have a look and see. Um, also, start with a, a large example early. You don't want to optimize to actually a small example and um, realize you have to use potentially different, different um, scheduler. Um, and then last point is formalize, formulate your problem for Dask. It may be that the way you've kind of chopped and diced your problem isn't suitable for Dask in your initial kind of formulation. So just have a think about what Dask wants and formulate your problem accordingly. In my case, we've, I started by loading each file individually, computing um, the results for that one file, putting it in the right place. Um, and in the Dask worldview, we create the output, we split it into tasks, and then we load all the files in each um, chunk, and then we go from there. Thanks. Thank you, Rose. Uh, I just want to quickly pause and check if there are any questions or comments. Um, nothing on chat. Um, let's check the Google Doc. Nothing um, on Google Doc. Yeah. There is an interesting is. question yeah. in the Google Doc. Um, yeah. So maybe I'll repeat it here and, and give a bit of a highlight about it, if that's OK. Uh, Absolutely. So, yeah, go on. Um, OK, so someone asked uh, if we can use Dask to summarize operations. Uh, so not only doing parallel things like Rose um, should, but if you want to, to do a, a global computation of, of on your full Dask array across chunks. And there, um, the quick answer will be it depends. Um, if you have, if you're doing something very standard like a, a mean um, or a standard deviation, and something which actually can be uh, implemented in a sort of a concur and divide manner, um, then Dask will very likely, uh, on Dask array, will very likely uh, provide an API for that, uh, and create a tree of task where you do a summation within a chunk, then across few chunks, and then the results of the chunks will be aggregated. If your algorithm is a bit more complicated, unfortunately, you will very likely need to sort of decompose it in a way that you can use the, the method from, from the task API to do this. Um, I don't know if you want to add something on, on this, Rose, or if we should um, carry on. Um, I think that's a very good, um, nothing to add. OK. I will take more questions at, at the at the end after Jan's uh, section, but uh, I think we can proceed for to, to be on time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Jan, feel free to share your screen. But... Thank you. So, uh, thank you. Um, so my talk is about um, a NACI consultancy project, which looked into using Dask for very large and parallel geospatial image analysis. And here I would like to present to you a few benchmark results and also present to you or share with you a few learnings from this, um, yeah, from these experiments. And mo I have to mention most of the work has been done by uh, Maxime, so thanks. Um, Maxime, for all your work. That was really um, insightful. And before I jump into the actual project, I would just would like to give you a brief overview of the remote sensing work that we are doing at Monarchy Fenoil Land Care Research. And uh, so one of our main research areas is to generate land cover and land use maps um, for entire New Zealand. And we mostly use um, medium to high resolution satellite data. More and more, we are also using aerial photography at various scales. We use um, hyperspectral and RGB photos taken from URVs and also um, yeah, use regional scale um, 
LiDAR or uh, LiDAR flown by drones for yeah, 3D analysis of mostly vegetation and trees, for instance. Um, most of our algorithms are basically um, self-written scripts and so, um, pro programs to do the, the GS analysis and remote sensing analysis. Uh, most of our critical mapping tasks um, mostly related to our large um, products like the LCDB, the land cover database for New Zealand or land use map for New Zealand is backed up by a few um, GS analysts. Um, recently over the last um, few years, um, we more and more used um, deep learning techniques um, in addition to our uh, existing workflows to yeah, come up with more fine-grained um, geospatial predictions and uh, more flexible ways of how we can operate and um, run our workflows. Um, most of our scripts are, as I mentioned, self-written, and it's mostly a bunch of Python scripts, Bash scripts that are um, orchestrated um, by the Slurm workload manager uh, on the NSC HPC to run all our processes at scale. And here are just a few examples of what types of data that we, we work with. So it's mostly 2D images of hyperspectral um, yeah, properties and also the um, yeah, sort of 2D um, version of the rasterized point clouds. So for us, there's a clear need for a flexible operational workflow for mapping exercises at a very local, so sub-regional scale, the regional scale, and also at the national scale. We are at the moment quite happy with our existing workflows. However, um, there's more and more um, uptake of new technologies like X-Array Dask to improve um, various aspects of um, workflows. So we were keen to look into this. And as a practical or as one toy problem we came up with, we wanted to um, try Dask and X-Array to work on a very simple problem. Um, here we looked into our Sent Sentinel-2 archive. So it consists of um, basically all imagery that is available back to 2016. Um, not sure if you can see that. So it's um, quite a large data set. Um, the analysis ready product, which only includes the final files is already um, over 10 terabytes in size. And this doesn't include all the raw data and intermediate data. And we have quite an evolved um, processing chain set up on Nessie, which sort of generates a consistent standardized product um, nationwide so um, that we can use the final product to derive standardized metrics or do time series analysis. Um, the benchmark settings of the toy problem is fairly straightforward and yeah, we kept it very simple. It's a typical load process and safe pattern. So we try to load in a remote sensing image, do some processing and um, store it. It sounds very straightforward, but there are a um, couple of quirks and um, things to consider. So the image that we use is one large uh, multiband Sentinel-2 image at 10 meter pixel resolution for the North Island of New Zealand. It contains um, 10 bands. Um, the, we um, just yeah focus on the 10 bands that are most useful for vegetation analysis. And the Kia image, so we use a, a geospatial raster format called Kia format. And this um, produces a 10 gigabyte image. I will um, speak more about the Kia format in one of the next slides. So the process that we want to run is basically calculating a very simple vegetation index here the NDVI from two bands of Sentinel-2 and we run this at an image block level so not um, loading the entire image um, in memory at once but um, just run it block by block by block so the vegetation index is basically that we look at here is um, a simple ratio band to pronounce sort of the different in spectral properties, uh, spectral absorption properties of vegetation in the near infrared and red spectral range. Then we um, want to store this um, NDVI information into a Kia format. 
and we try out a sort of sequential way using raster io but also use a parallel processing approach using dask using different 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 um, backends and block sizes um a few notes to the kia format so this was basically developed um or designed specifically for our remote sensing data stack on Nessie, on the Nessie HPC. It has a couple of very nice additions to the sort of normal GeoTIFF that most people are used to. So it's, um, it, has, it includes very sensible default compression settings. It uh, um, includes raster attribute tables. It stores all the permit layers and statistics and a few other information all internally in, in just one file. So it's quite easy to um, move it around and it works very well with very large data sets. So one Kia file could easily um, in, yeah, include um, tens of terabytes of information. So <clears throat> here um, on the next line, you can see a very simple um, loading pattern that is used to read in such a geo, um, geospatial format using the package called Ryo X-Array. So basically open your file. And what happens is that um, Ryo X-Array um, generates an X-Array data array, which is one of the container formats um, Rose uh, mentioned earlier. Underneath, it will call raster IO, which is basically a very light wrapper around um, a few GDAL functions to, and GDAL is the underlying geospatial driver that um, enables reading and writing of um, geospatial formats. So here we specify also the chunk size. So that's the image block size in the X and Y dimensions. And we can also specify which bands we want to load. So if you look here, down here, you can see that the array on disk or in memory is actually much larger. If you, if you were to load the entire image at once into a, um, memory, it would be 80 gigabytes in size. But one um, chunk only contains 32 megabytes, which is much more manageable. Um, the way you operate in the X-Array and Dask world is it feels very, lumpy like however there are a couple of important differences so uh, mostly uh, it's uh, most operations happen um, lazy and um, grace also mentioned that already uh, um, uh, rose sorry <laughs> um, so we um, use um, functions to operate on the data set they are not executed directly but only once you call uh, and few methods like compute, load, or you save uh, the array to disk. And here's a very simple um, instruction to calculate an NDVI with um, yeah few operations um, to tidy up the data set. Um, Rose also explained to you um, the task graph that is produced by X-Array and Dask in the background. So you have to basically um, read it from bottom up. So it starts at the image and then it will generate a sometimes complex looking graph um, of the loading pattern for each image block. And then each node represents the processing step. And then at the end, it basically convert, it writes all the individual and processed um, bits of information into a file. Um, a very useful method um, from X-Array is a function called apply ufunc, which stands for apply universal function. So you can basically move your instructions into a Python method. Um, compute. This one is here, compute NDVI, and you can run this method across the entire image. If you wrap it into the apply ufunc method, you can select the bands from the X-Array data array that should be passed on to this method. You can set the no data value, um, which is um, related to the GDAL um, convention of um, setting no data values. You can tell which kind of backends should be used um, by Dask. Here it's um, using a parallelized one. And also you can specify the output types. Um, Rose also mentioned the um, different schedulers from Dask. So once you have your Dask array 
or um, your X-ray data array, which is turned into a task array when you apply um, those methods. This will create a task graph, and then you have to decide which scheduler you want to use to do the actual processing. Um, and there are a few important differences. For instance, if you work on a single machine, you might want to choose between multi, multiple threads or multiple processes. Um, most, if you only apply Python methods, then they probably don't release the Python um, glo global interpreter lock. So which means that um, effectively it, everything will just run on one single thread and there's no concurrency and it will be very slow. So sometimes it's better to use multiple processes. However, um, from this experience, we found out that the distributed scheduler, which is um, a package that you have to install on top of um, Dask, provides you a, um, several additional schedulers like the local cluster and slurm cluster. And the local cluster works quite well to distribute workers on one machine, whereas the slurm cluster basically um, can submit individual slurm jobs to a number of host workers on different nodes, for instance, on the SEHPC. So the, and it also provides the very useful dashboard that Rose showed you earlier. Um, one important thing um, that always comes up when working with uh, GDAL on um, memory on, or GDAL processes where memory is an issue. So you need to set the GDAL cache max environmental uh, environment variable to a sensible value. And this is extremely important when working with lots of individual workers from Dask because GDAL will consume all the memory basically it has or it can use at some point. And so you need to um, set it carefully to a value um, that is well below the memory limit. Otherwise you run into these out of memory errors. So this is for instance, one example graph from the dashboard. And once you set it to a more sensible value, the workers actually um, have more uh, memory available and GDAL is not eating up all the memory. Um, one of our benchmark results, and I think this is a really great um, figure, which basically shows um, the difference between the different workers or this, this it shows the difference between the um, different schedulers. And if you uh, look at the gray bar, which is basically the baseline um, uh, scenario, and this is just a simple for loop using Rust.io to load each image block um, sequentially into memory, run your process of calculating the NDVI, um, save it and go to the next block. So it's a sequential one. The multiple processes procs uses um, a range of different um, or number of different processes. Um, local cluster is the is from the distributed package. Uh, also the slurm and slurm sar is also from um, the distributed package. So if you look at the left hand side here and the left hand figure, you can see that we chose a block size of roughly 2000 by 2000 um, pixels. We apply the youth, uh, universal function of calculating the NDVI. And what um, pops out is that you can see that the if you use the processes, num multiple processes, it actually um, takes much longer if you um, use four cores and run um, run it with the scheduler. So it slows down your NDVR computation and you have to increase it to almost 16 workers to um, yeah, half your processing time. The local cluster seems to be much more efficient. So you can, and it actually doesn't matter how many workers you use at the end. So even four workers um, have a significant um, impact on, uh, on the performance. Interesting enough, the Slurm scheduler, which basically sends out a Slurm job for each um, image block, gets slower once you add more workers to it. And the 
best scheduler that we found is the Slurm SAR one. And some of you might already um, know what, what the reason is for this interesting pattern, looking at the processes, local clusters, Slurm and Slurm SAR. So I will come back to that later, but I just want to mention that the Slurm SAR basically makes use of a um, new file format which is a distributed file format. It stores each image block that it processed into a different file. So there's almost no um, overhead in storing the file. Whereas for all the other um, schedulers, we have this overhead of um, individual workers trying to compete for a lock to write to the same file. So that's just a summary of what I just explained to you. So, and another interesting um, effect that what we found out is if you increase the chunk size, so you, um, instead of using an image size of 2000 by 2000 pixels, if you move to an image size of 4000 by 4000 pixels, which is um, often recommended to decrease the overhead of having more workers. So you basically have less workers, but you use more memory. But interestingly enough, on the local cluster, this had no effect. And not sure if Maxime found out the reason for this. Um, so all in all, the main problem is really the locking issue, that if you have multiple processes doing a very simple um, computation of calculating an NDVI, they are very quick in this computation. However, they all try to compete um, for the lock to write the output to the same file. And this is um, this is what you can see here as well. So if you have four workers, it takes 158 seconds to do everything and to write to the file. But if you have 16 workers, all of a sudden you have um, you end up with um, yeah 467 seconds to complete. Um, all the steps. And this is mo um, because it, it basically, the, each worker has to wait for another worker to finish writing to the file. And the SAR format um, was, is quite a recent um, file format, which um, gained a lot of traction in environmental sciences because it basically looks very much like a HDF file format. It works really well with X-Array and Dask. It provides um, multi-dimensional arrays and metadata. Um, it has chunk, um, works on chunks. It has uh, sensible compression set options and um, provides different storage backends. So normally it will create for each image chunk an individual file on disk which is not recommended actually on Nessie because it will um, quickly pollute your um, project folder with sometimes hundreds of thousands of tiny little files. However, it uh, enables you to um, do a very fast parallel write um, on disk. So basically you get a, if you have 16 workers, um, running your computation, you get a speed off of almost 15 times. So that's um, um, the main advantage. However, in the GIS world, if you want to display your um, final computation or your result, it's, it's a bit difficult because at the moment, um, ZAR format has only rudimentary um, support for GDAL and the existing GDAL driver doesn't support um, pyramid layers and um, um, statistics that are uh, stored inside the SAR format. So it's actually not useful to display it in a GIS environment or in um, similar um, remote sensing software packages. So we have to convert it to a more common geospatial format to actually look at re your result. And so just briefly on the conclusions, um, X-Array and um, Dask work great for geospatial data analysis. The desk, Dask dashboard is quite useful to visualize and profile your um, processes. And the performance on Dask uh, 
the performance of Dask really depends on the backends and on the file formats, which is one of the main bottlenecks. And in our work, most of the issues are basically that the I that most of the processes are I/O bound because the computation is actually quite light, but um, it's always that the I/O is the limiting factor. So the next step for um, this consultancy project and um, us looking into this um, is trying to look how we can optimize a conversion from the ZAR format to a Kia format. Um, try to look at different backends like MPI and also run those computations in over um, lapping blocks. That's it from me. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Um, we do have some time left. And before we get to the questions, um, Maxime, would you like to go through the um, slide now or after the questions? Oh, I think we can we can answer the the question. There are two in the in the Google Doc, and if anyone else uh, has has any pending question, feel free to put them in the chat or, or in the Google Doc. Yeah. So one of the question is from from Tristan, and he's asking if there's any tips on how to speed up the scheduling algorithm with Task. So he finds that um, when he creates a good size chunks and he calls the compute methods, as you highlighted, Jan, uh, basically it can take up to two or three minutes be before any of the workers actually start doing stuff uh, when he's using multiprocessing. So he was asking if, if you have any uh, opinion or feedback on this. Um, and uh, Rose, also, if you have an opinion on this, you can, you can also, also comment if you want. Otherwise, I can have a go at this one. So, <laughs> so to, <laughs> um, I mean, that's that's what can happen is is um, if you have many, 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 many tasks, uh, you can basically um, the the task scheduler will not behave well if you have a, about a million tasks uh, because basically the overhead of the bookkeeping of just knowing what's the work to be done and where uh, to 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 which worker to send it can be a bit overwhelming and task has not been designed for that. So if it is what you're experiencing, um, I would recommend that you actually uh, uh, try a smaller test case just to see if actually the, the size of your test case matters for that or increase the chunk size if you can, if your workers will have still enough memory to process an individual chunk. Um, if it's not that, then uh, yeah, well, we, we probably would need to go with a profiler and check if there's anything going under the hood, like moving data around that actually is not part of the task itself, but maybe of the prep of the, of the, the computation. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I can see that there's another question from Luke. Uh, does ZAR still have the speed benefit if you have workers post-processing the files into more common file formats? Uh, I don't know, Jan or Rose, if you wanted to have a go at it or Maxime <laughs> can go, have a go again. Um, I think you can go for this one, Jan, because you, <laughs> you, you've put the answer on the last slide. <laughs> yeah, um, at the moment, um, what I found of my experience is that it's actually faster to do a um, processing of the um, file using raster io or a simple um, local cluster using dask directly on the in the kia format so you save it directly to the kia format so, and even though the speed up by um, having the intermediate um, SAR format um, makes a big difference for the computation the conversion from the SAR format to kia format again is limited by the io and is limited um, yeah, by, by all the workers trying to compete for the same block. So this running two processes, uh, uh, two of those processes, the computation and then the conversion takes longer than doing just the processing and saving it to a geospatial format like um, Kia directly. So, but maybe um, there are ways in the future to improve this. Uh, thanks, Jan. Um, and if 
anybody has thought of a question while all of this was going on, please feel free to use the chat function, the QA doc, or unmute yourselves at this point, and that's fine too. Um, Otherwise, I think we can we can wrap up at this. Yeah, I think there are no more questions. So I will quickly share the last couple of slides. Uh, Maxime, I'm going to let you speak to this one. Okay, so first, thank you everyone for, for joining us today. And um, it's just a quick advertisement for the Computational Science Consultancy Service at NISI, which I'm part of. And I just wanted to let you know that if you like what you've seen today, uh, this is a sort of work we do with scientists um, to help them to run their code better and faster on, on NISI. It's not only about prioritization code. I mean, we can also help you to develop some code, to put things on GPUs and do a bit of upskilling uh, along this. So, and if you have um, if you have an allocation on, on NISI, it's very, very likely that we have access for free to our services. The best way to know how we could help you the best is actually to contact support at nisi.org.nz and then we'll get in touch with you and, and see how we can work together and and that's it for the consultancy ad <laughs> <laughs> thanks maxime and the final words from us would be thank you so much for your attention thank you so much for coming in today and being a part of this webinar uh, you will be receiving an email very soon with the recording the li link to the recording of this webinar and a feedback form uh, please please take some time it's a very quick uh, form please um, give us your feedback let us know how you like the webinar and also take some time to think of any topics that you might want to uh, see from our side covered in the upcoming months or the next year uh, we'd be happy to get your feedback and comments on that so um, and please do join our mailing list if you haven't already. Uh, I will be sharing these links in the email that will come your way um, soon. And as usual, if you have any training requests, we are happy to listen to you and, and find out more about your requests. Please email us at training at nessie.org.nz. And if you have any questions, suggestions or feedback, or if you are thinking about any sort of projects that you might want us to um, look into or help you with, uh, please email support at nissi.org.nz. And thank you. Have an amazing Thursday.